right. I, I, first, I have to apologize. I do what I often do, which is a bait and switch. Uh, so I got the um, agenda from Helen a few weeks ago. And I thought, you know, I've got this Hudson River talk, and I could just give that. But I started to look at, you know, the issues that are going to be addressed later, um, you know, water quality, shoreline impacts, fish habitat, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, or as we like to call it, SAV. And, and I realized we do so much of this. I uh, wrote a whole new talk for you. So uh, if this doesn't work, I apologize. And <laughs> if it does, then, then it, it works. Um, to begin with, let me just say, I have done none of this research. One of the privileges and one of the pains of being the head of an institution is you need to learn to speak fluidly about the work of your, your staff. As Bill said, I've got remarkable staff. We're very similar to CIS. We do science. We don't differentiate between pure and applied. Uh, we publish in top journals. We do the kind of science that uh, makes our colleagues at Stanford and Michigan and, and Georgia jealous because we have much more time because we don't have students. Um, but fundamentally, we care about whether that science is used uh, to improve management and policy at the local, regional, and national levels, and sometimes even international. Um, so let me just jump in. Let me give you the outline. I want to just give an overview of why you put values on a watershed, right? And, and the whole question of ecosystem services. Uh, I want to take a case study on tidal freshwater wetlands uh, in the Hudson, talk a bit about freshwater mussels, which again is something we've studied both in the Hudson and its tributaries and over into the Housatonic for a very long time. Dave Strayer, who gave me almost all the information for this, is legendary not only as one of the experts on freshwater mussels globally, but also he's the man who discovered the zebra mussel in the Hudson River. Uh, one year there were a few of them, the next year there were a few billion of them. Um, and so that work is really important, both in terms of the, the ironies of ecosystem services, but also the impacts that an invasive species can have. I'm going to shift upstream a bit to lakes. Uh, one of our more recent hires, Chris Solomon, does. I like him because he works on vertebrates. I'm a wildlife biologist, but I'm running an ecosystem science. And so most of my staff work on nutrients and, and primary productivity. And, and Chris likes to go upstream and up, up the food chain to fish. Um, then I want to go into the woods surrounding the watershed and talk about an ecosystem service that is not usually thought of as a service, which is the way in which biodiversity affects Lyme disease and, and tick, transmission of tick-borne disease. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just do a quick summary. So why do we set a value on ecosystems? Why are we obsessed with, or why are some people obsessed with this idea of ecosystem services? Well. I think to begin with, it's to show its importance. Gretchen Daly out at Stanford, who's really was on the forefront of establishing this idea of, of putting an economic value on ecosystem services uh, to people. And it was defined from the beginning as services to people. So when people say ecosystem services, they mean to people, not to the ecosystem, not to the other critters that live in it, not to sort of global good and some sort of intangible, but it's actually to people. Um, here on River, there's a wonderful paper by Isley et al. that I pulled from because uh, no one's done this for the Hudson Estuary. But you know, you can look at the following economic impacts, right? $50 million in economic output, 641 local jobs, $600 million in added property value by restoration and cleaning up and managing the system well, maybe $150 million in, in, in other environmental values and 2.6 million visitor days uh, to the Huron River for recreation. And those are the kinds of things we look at when we're trying to put value on, right? Uh, and one of the other things it allows us to do is, and, and this is, I think, critical for planners, look at the alternate values. So, you know, from an ecological perspective, this is not good, right? This is a pumping station dam. It's not a terribly large dam, but even very small dams have huge ecological impacts, uh, particularly if you're uh, migrating fish, um, and but it has economic value. When you remove it, you lose that economic value, but you gain ecological value and perhaps ecological services. Trading off fishing and fisheries and not having to stock and various other things against the value that a dam has, both in terms of energy and flood control, uh, water, uh, 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 putting water aside, and so on and so forth. Um, it allows you to look at those. Um, and you might choose the alternative with the greatest value, but the question is to whom, right? Um, and even if we can't, 
estimate the values, I would argue that this kind of ecosystem services approach helps you put, you know, uh, evaluate alternatives and from a perspective of when you're sitting um, with politicians and trying to explain to them, you know, what the alternatives are, it will help. You know, there is a very basic category of values, you know, different classifications. I'm just going to use a fairly standard one uh, because it's simpler and, the, and it's one you're likely to have heard before. So, you know, there are direct use or market values. You can uh, do water uh, in, uh, entrapment uh, for uh, water supply. Um, and again, in Delaware Basin, I'm stealing from other basins where there are data. Uh, that's, I think, what scientists do. Um, uh, you know, about $3 billion worth of fresh water provisioning in the Delaware uh, Basin. You know, $34 million, and actually, let me go back so you can see. This is a wonderful uh, painting, 19th century painting of shad fisheries. Uh, but there, you know, three, $34 billion of, in the fisheries, $20 million in energy production. And then there are uh, values the river brings to agriculture indirectly, which come in at about a 50% increase. Again, that's from the Huron River because it hasn't been estimated anywhere else that I could find. Um, you know, there are other direct uses. Uh, recreation, uh, bird watching, fishing, uh, and, you know, so, so recreation and boats, fishing, and just sitting back and watching the river flow, right, that we don't put a value on. And again, part of the problem is all of these uh, activities are hard to measure um, from a direct, oops, I must have, from a direct market perspective, right? Um, and then there are things that, but they're not trivial, right? So uh, you can estimate them in various ways, right? If you can't put a direct dollar value on it, how do you try and factor it in uh, to your analysis? So one of the things is you can look at travel costs. So how much is someone willing to spend to get to the river, put their kayak in and kayak in terms of direct value to them? Because if someone's willing to spend, you know, if you put 53 cents federal rate per mile on it, and you say they're going 40 miles on average, you know, so they're spending $50, $60 in travel costs alone, right? Um, and that's one way to evaluate it. So each person kayaking adds $50. Uh, you can actually look at the replacement cost if you remove this and have to create another uh, opportunity somewhere else from physical infrastructure by looking at distance travel, please see point one. And you can look at the replacement costs as well. You can survey willingness to pay. And this is a really interesting idea. Um, you can ask people, if you were to do this activity, how much would it be worth with you? How much would you pay to do this activity? And those surveys, they're, they're complicated surveys because you ask the same question 12 different ways uh, because you want to find a mean on those 12 different values. Uh, but it's a really powerful way to put an economic value on something that is traditionally very hard to value. Um, and doing that, you, you know, using these different ways, Delaware Basins, it's somewhere between hundreds of millions to billions of dollars in uncaptured value if you're doing an analysis. And again, you'll see there's an order of magnitude difference there. But I think the point is not to say $562 million, but to say it's big. And these are values that are important to people and they have a scale. All right. Um, these indirect use values can be huge. Right? So if you look at uh, a lake system, um, this is the Midwest, uh, if you get a, a zooplankton coming in that you know, clouds up the water, what's the cost of that? Well, it was estimated at about $100 million in lost productivity, lost fishing, uh, decreased land values, um, and so on per year. Right? Um, other ways to assign value, you, know, you could look at the cost of reducing the phosphorus that came about as a result of pollution that led to the, the blooming of the zooplankton. Or you can ask people, again, what's the value of clear water? And these are all ways of getting at valuing the ecosystem. Um, then there's something called existence value. And uh, my favorite one on this is uh, a friend of mine was trying to figure out the value of, uh, of elephant ivory to globally. And uh, he did surveys in like 62 countries and basically said, how much would you pay to know that there are elephants in the world? And it wasn't a lot, it's four or five dollars, three dollars in some developing countries, maybe it was 30 cents. But the point is by asking people what their willingness to pay is, you can get it. Um, you can also look at it, and I was on the phone yesterday morning with a friend of mine who runs species conservation for WWF, and Margaret said, well, what, just look up you know, WWF's contributions. And I found 2016 was the, the last uh, 990 form, which is their tax returns, or what a nonprofit does for tax returns. And in, you know, in, oops, in, um, 2016, 
They had a membership of two, that, that kicked in $225 million, $100 million of which came from individuals. So 33 cents per person in the country, plus or minus, right? And so this is an existence value. They are, people are joining these organizations because they do things that help wildlife exist, right? You can go on and on, but the point is there are ways and means to value things that we don't directly value, right? Um, then finally, there's the option value, and that's the value for the future, right? Uh, what is this worth as a bequest to our future generations? As we look at the impacts of climate change, you'll have noticed, you could not have noticed, uh, that teenagers are getting politically active about this because the bequest value, uh, um, the negative bequest value, because if you're an economist, everything can have negative and positive values, the negative bequest value of what we are doing to the planet is significant and also being recognized by the people we are leaving it to. I have a four, almost 14 year old, so uh, I get this all the time. Um, oftentimes though, bequest values are literally impossible to measure. Um, we have to assume that they're high because we don't know the full value, as Aldo Leopold said, uh, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Right? The quote gets used a lot in many different ways uh, because it, it's a wonderful uh, vision. Um, but also I think it's important to note that bequest value is changing rapidly and unpredictably through climate change, land use conversion, increased intensification of agriculture, all the things that we look at day to day um, from different perspectives. And so as you think about talking to people about bequest value, I think you know the, the, the British expression, belts and braces, so suspenders and, and a belt uh, to hold your trousers up because you need multiple forms of, 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 of approaches uh, to solving problems is important. Um, you know, it's, I would say, not necessarily a trivial value, right? Um, and it can be increased through education, right? So oddly enough, just educating people about the bequest value makes them put a greater value on it and therefore increases the bequest value. So education is an amplifier of bequest value and of option value to some extent, right? So those are the ways we talk about values. And I now wanna sort of shift gears and talk about ecological ways of talking about values from sort of, oops, oops. I'm having trouble with this clicker. There we go. Uh, from uh, the Hudson River at its mouth uh, to upriver, um, same picture, two ways. Um, but this is the, the, some, some panoramics of the Hudson that uh, friend Joe Aronson gave me. Uh, and the Hudson River, right, um, we, I wanna do a couple case studies. I wanna first talk about tidal fresh water. Right? If you look at the, the wetlands along the Hudson from Troy down to Kingston, down to, Manha uh, to Manhattan, right, you can see there are wetlands all the way through. The Hudson is an interesting river because it is a tidal river and it uh, has a lot of salt intrusion. If you look down at Pier 84 off the west side of Manhattan, you'll see there's a diurnal you know, impact of tides and following it with a time lag is salt. And so you have salt coming, you get, you get tidal push and then it pushes salt water up and you get, uh, pardon me, you get a layer depending on how close you are. Is the mic working still? It just changed, I, I didn't hear it as much. Further away. Uh, I'm further away, is that it? Okay. Um, so you get intrusion and you get this layering and it's a really dynamic system. If you go up 100 miles, what you see is the salt, you still have salinity, but it's pretty constant and it's more a diffusion process, but you still get 100 miles upriver, you're still getting very significant tidal impacts. This is weird, right? It's not, this is not common. <laughs> But it's because the Hudson's like this, it's not like that, right? You know, uh, you look at Chesapeake Bay, it's like that, right? You, you rise the level of Chesapeake Bay, you could probably do a nice GIS analysis and see where shoreline, pro waterfront property is gonna be in 100 years, right? If you assume three foot rise, you, you, know, you can map that out. In the Hudson, it's just gonna go up, right? There's very little vertical, um, sorry, horizontal move, it's all vertical because of the way that the river has cut its, its bed. Now, there's some factoids about wetlands. You know, there are about 200 of them. They're about 50 acres. They're not huge, but they're not small. Um, covers, you know, 4,500 4, hectares. Uh, it's about 15% of the river area. As I said, because of the nature of the river, it's not a huge basin. It's not like the you know, bottom of the Mississippi where it used to flood out into vast areas. Um, one of the interesting facts that, that, that this is uh, Stuart Finlay, who's a distinguished senior scientist at Cary and has studied these things for 35 years. Uh, and Stuart and I were talking about it and he said, you know, 
two and a half percent of the volume of the river goes in and out of the wetlands every day. Right? And I did a little math, right? That means that the river, the entire river volume flows in and out of the wetlands nine times a year. Right? And if the AFU, and these are numbers that I pulled from different sources, so you know whether this is legitimate or not, it's more heuristic than real. I'm not saying these numbers are right, but they're indicative. Right? If you have an annual discharge of 15 billion cubic meters, which is, if you take the daily discharge and multiply it by 365, the wetlands are exchanging 135 billion cubic meters of water every year. Right? So when I start talking about the services they bring, like uh, flood control, wildlife habitat, protection of subsurface water, recreation, but pollution, and I'm going to hit one point on pollution, uh, erosion control, uh, education, and open space, you start to see that from a from a uh, hydrological perspective, good thing Peter left, I'm sure. How many hydrologists in the, in the room that are really going <laughs> to whack me? Okay, good. You can whack me privately later, please. Um, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, these volumes are, are tremendous, right? And so what do they do ecologically? I was going to put in nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and, and uh, look at oxygen flows. And I stared at the data, and I went to Stuart yesterday, and I said, okay, I'm taking the oxygen slide out because I don't understand it. And he said, well done, boss. He said, oxygen is not comprehensible. You know, we cannot, despite 35 years of research, we're not really sure. Yeah, we know that wetlands suck up oxygen, but it's not clear that it's a bad thing. And, it, and you know, so it's like, whew, at least, you know, there were three slides, and I stared at them for half an hour, and I just could not figure them out. And the answer is, that was the point, right? Um, but if you look at a, an average wetland, you've got, got the grasses, the graminoid vegetation, you've got broadleaf vegetation further down, and then you have submerged vegetation. There's about a, you know, 60 centimeter, what's that, two foot? you know, difference between and amongst them. So they're, 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 uh, they're layered, and what happens there differs, right? And as I said, there's a, a lot of exchange between the wetlands and, and the mainstream of the river. Um, looking at nitrates is a really good way because ni nitrogen pollution is increasingly a problem, and looking at the way in which the wetlands capture it is very important. Um, and what's really interesting is as the water comes up and flows in, the slope of this line is how much nitrogen is being pulled out. And it's phenomenal, right? Uh, over a course of a day, uh, and a meter, you know, it's pulling out, uh, you, know, mil you know, in terms of uh, cu per cubic meter, um, a fair amount of nitrogen, right? And this is happening over and over. The more graminoid vegetation you have, so those high areas, right, those are the most productive. They suck up the nitrogen best. And so the more of that you have, the better it will do. Right, so you get slow removal, um, that's the slope of that line, and that measures removal. We get slow removal uh, with little vegetation cover in the upper levels, and the faster it is. So you want a wetland that is not just like this, but more like that and high up with lots of graminoid vegetation that gets, uh, gets flooded you know, at least twice a day. Um, there are many ways that nitrogen disappears. It can go out as a gas, uh, it can get uh, taken up by plants, or it can be used by microbes in the litter. And, and because the litter is, is deeper, muckier, and, and better, that's part of why the graminoid vegetation does well, but also the density of, of plants is higher up there. Um, now, there is a challenge to all this, and so I wanted to make sure I said the word climate change at least once in this talk to link to the last year. Um, you know, I said you got the average wetland, you get vertical growth through sediments accruing, and you get horizontal movement. And as I said, the horizontal movement isn't so good in the Hudson. Um, and so what's going to happen with loss of wetland in climate change in the Hudson? Um, basically, Stewart did an analysis and said, uh, given the you know, projections, the median IPCC projection, amount of water that's coming down, parenthesis, about 25% more water coming down the Hudson now than 30 years ago. Unfortunately, it comes down in pulses. Uh, so much of it comes in when we get Irene or Sandy or a major uh, extreme weather event. But it's, you know, it's carrying a lot more water. And that will continue because the Northeast is going to get wetter and, dry, uh, wetter and hotter. Right? So, um, but to keep uh, pace with sea level rise, you know, a couple centimeters at most a year. And, and so how's it doing and how, in God's name, do you figure out how it's doing? Well, you know, in future scenarios, if you don't keep up, you know, what you're going to lose is the high intertidal where all that good graminoid vegetation sits, right? So in terms of ecosystem services, climate change could be a disaster. 
right? So what Stewart did was a, a, a clever, and, and I think uh, others have used it, but it's a clever way of doing it. Lead gets put down in sediments. Lead was put down from the turn of the uh, 20th century all the way through the late 70s at a fairly high level, and then all of a sudden it disappears. Right? And that's 1975, plus or minus round figures. So when you do a core, you can have a date in your core that says 1975. And then from the top of the core to 1975 gives you how many centimeters of uh, sediments have been laid down in that, in that marsh. And then you divide that by, you know, 40 years, and you get your answer on, on how fast the sediments are going down. And there's good news and bad news. Is we did uh, cores on uh, 16 marshes, uh, again, from the Tappan Zee Bridge. So this is upriver. Now uh, the um, uh, Mario Cuomo Bridge, excuse me. Got to redo the slide. Uh, all the way up uh, to West Point and then to Tivoli, which is up near us, and then uh, north to the capital in Albany. Um, and what you see is from south to north, there's a real difference. Northern marshes are accreting much more quickly than southern marshes. And they're accreting at a rate that will keep them up with climate change here, but not here. Right? And so what you're going to see is there's not much hope for horizontal movement. There's pretty good hope for vertical movement in the north, but not the south. And so because there's not enough sediment going in the river, oddly and weirdly, uh, except for in these huge floods, where floods carry fine sediments all the way down into the harbor and out into the, into the Hudson Canyon, right? Um, there's a problem brewing. We can blame this on the Catskills and the Adirondacks and on the visionary uh, management put in place in the late 19th century when the Catskills and the Adirondacks were created as a anti-sediment strategy. They've been you know, pretty much rape, ravaged, and pillaged for their timber and for bark to tan leather and various other things. And they were filling up the Hudson and the Erie Canal. And that is why they created, that was the initial impetus. It wasn't for conservation reasons. It wasn't to play around with restoration. It was to look at this. How am I doing on time? Because um, I forgot my... You're good. Okay. Um, very good. Very good? All right. Very good is good. Um, and so and I said to Stuart, because we have programs in the Catskills and the Adirondacks as well, I said, so, so this is another marker of conservation success. You know, we just forgot to think about climate change. So one answer is to remove the forever wild provision in the Catskills and the Adirondacks, start cutting them down and let some more sediment into the river. And I jest, but it's, it's, a, a, it's a hard one. Um, I want to talk about freshwater mussels, A, because Dave Strayer had more material on freshwater mussels than you can imagine, and B, because it's a cool story and, and creates a conundrum. Um, you know, they're really, well, let me phrase this, they once were really valuable before we started making everything out of plastic. Um, they had a big um, market for pearls, buttons, and, and uh, cultured pearl nuclei. Um, and, you know, in the 20, early 20th century, the value in hundreds of millions, uh, you know, in, to, in today's value, $6 billion from 93 to 63. Um, aren't any good numbers for pearls? That's for buttons. Right? Amazing, amazing, you know, just to think about how many muscles that required. Um, you know, and the fisheries value of about $10 billion. Um, since then, the harvests are much smaller, the numbers have declined, water pollution really whacked freshwater mussels, now invasives are whacking them, they're really very sensitive, and these things, I remember Dave picked up a mussel about that big, handed it to me and said, okay, how old is that mussel? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, I do because I've been looking at that mussel for 30 years. He said, that's a 75-year-old mussel. Right? And, and they grow so slowly. Or we think of mussels because we put them on strings in aquaculture and you know, grow them really fast. We think that they grow really quickly, but they, the freshwater native um, species don't. Um, all right, so they also provide stuff other than economic value. You know, they structure, um, oh, look at that, I've got this here. Um, you know, they, they structure ecosystems by, by filtering, and all these freshwater filters uh, are really important. Um, that helps increase submerged aquatic vegetation by bringing more light down. That then leads to increased fish production. Um, you know, mussels, so mussels have these indirect values as well as the direct ones, right? Um, but I also really, I was up at, at the Gund, Gund Institute uh, at the University of Vermont. Uh, Taylor Ricketts, who runs that, one of these Stanford acolytes, uh, came out of Gretchen Daly's lab. And we were having this discussion, and, and it's really nice to see that the people in that world of ecosystem services are starting to say, yeah, we screwed up 20 years ago. We should have talked more broadly about services for not just society, but services for the systems in which these species live. And mussels are a great example of that, right? They, they, um, you know, they store nutrients through their tissues and their shells. 
Um, they are ecosystem engineers. They do bioturbation and turnover uh, soils by digging. Uh, that oxygenates the soils. As I, uh, again, I said, oxygen is to freshwater system as nitrogen is terrestrial. It's not to be trusted. Right. <laughs> it's really hard to track. Um, they, uh, they, as I said before, pull out suspended materials and, and have all those things and possibly, you know, other things as, as well as moving pathogens. Uh, you know, we, we are the billion oyster project that you've been involved with and the oysters you got back here. They're really good filters. You might not want to eat them, right, because they're so good at filtering. Um, all right, they, they uh, can uh, release um, soluble nitrogen phosphorus and they can deposit uh, uh, calcium and, and maybe carbon through their shells in, in the beds, if you think fossils, right? And you think they're in mucky soils and they die and they get buried, well, that, any carbon in there is pretty much permanently stored, right? Now, you have to be at a scale to do that, right? Oh, physical structure, right? They provide, you know, places for other things to attach, like oysters. Um, you know, and you've got to think about this in the economic terms as well. And so if you look in 1991 in the Hudson uh, Basin, you know, 300 million uh, cubic meters of water filtered a day. It's about 55 kilograms of nitrogen, three and a half kilograms of phosphorus. You can put an economic value on that if you want for sequestration. By 2011, because of the declines, those numbers had crashed. That's the bad news. The, and I'll put this in quotes, good news is that invasive mussels really weren't doing very much in 1991 because there weren't very many of them. Oh, by 1993, as I said, when they found them, there weren't very many. When they, two years later, there were billions of them. They were taking out about twice as much um, uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus as the native mussels, right? So if you're looking at market values and restoration, here's the conundrum that I said mussels plays for us. Um, you know, current population of the natives, eh, not doing very much for you. If you had based your analysis and your decision making on the value of native mussels, when the market declines, your argument for conservation declines. And that's a problem. Furthermore, right, the invasion by non-native species, because they occur at higher densities and do more of what mussels do, actually increases the service value, despite being a disaster ecologically. Right? So you get this you know, uh, offset values. And this is true with Phragmites. Right, we've done some analyses in the wetlands. If we were to go and pull up all the Phragmites in Hudson wetlands, the carbon storage would crash, right? And it would take years and possibly never, because if you pull up the Phragmites, you might lose the marsh because the soil, the sediments go down, so on and so forth. The relationship between invasives and services is complicated because invasives, by their general nature, are good at providing services because they're dense, they grow quickly, and they, you know, push out those inferior competitors i.e. native species. Right? So, bit of a problem. You know, so, uh, unionids, you know, it's not clear if you're going to do services where it lands you. All right, I'm going to shift gears a little bit up uh, the, the feeding chain to, to fish and out the, into to lakes. Much of this work was not done in the Hudson Valley, but you'll forgive me because I wanted to showcase this work for two reasons. One of which is Chris Sullins, a new staff member, and I really like talking about the younger generation of curry scientists. Parenthesis, when I got there, the median age of a carry scientist was 59. It's now 63. But it's about to switch with our next hire. It drops down to 47. Right? <laughs> Yay. And then it's going to keep going down because we're going to keep hiring more people. But we're trying. We had an even age stand of scientists. They were all hired in 1983 to 1989, and none of them left. And so I ended up with this group of scientists. The good news is I get to hire a lot of people. The bad news is young scientists don't have the same fundraising draw as the older scientists who bring in grants better because they've done it more. So we're going to have a financial disaster for a little while, but we've made accommodation. Um, anyway, so let's talk about lake fisheries. Oh, the other reason is Chris said to me, oh, great. If you're talking about this, we've got this CNH couple natural and human systems grants from NSF. He said, and I can put this on a, on a, you know, on, on a checklist for, for broader impacts, right? So you all consider yourself a broader impact. Um, <laughs> all right. So people like to fish. You know that. And, you know, there are many, many ways to make anglers happy. You know, you can look at the size. You can reduce the cost. You can, um, you know, uh, make them challenging. People like to fish, you know, tarpon. Why? Not because they're good to eat, but because they're really hard to fish, right? Um, but more than anything else, they prefer catch per unit effort to go up. 
Satisfaction correlates with catch per unit effort. Messy, yes, this is really messy data, but it, there's a good solid correlation, right? Chris has been doing some research with colleagues for the last 10 years on the relationship around lakes of houses, you know, wood, but not wood on houses, but wood in forests, uh, stocking and mortality, and the taxes that they charge for this. So basically, it's a story of mortality and taxes, or as we say, death and taxes, right? Um, the first law of fisheries is that small fish need a place to hide if they want to become big fish, because otherwise they're going to get eaten. And that's the you know, just simplifying it to the extreme, the places they hide are the woody vegetation along lake edges or along river edges or in the submerged aquatic vegetation or anywhere where it's either hard to see or hard to get to if you're a big fish. Uh, and what happens is people remove woody vegetation from shorelines because it's messy. Same reason people cut down standing dead trees, much to the dis, you know, dismay of uh, woodpeckers and everything that comes in behind them. All right, uh, we are not good stewards of mess. People like neat and clean. Uh, I do not weed my garden. I plant wildflowers in the front flower beds. I live in Sharon, Connecticut, which is a very Tony neighborhood, and I got such grief for the mess in my front yard. And I just looked and said, pollinator garden, done. All right, and, and uh, I told them how many species of bees I'd seen last year, and I put a little plaque up in front of my house to educate people. But we don't like mess. People don't like, they want lawns, they want uh, ornamentals that are all brought in from China with invasive pests and pathogens on them, right? People don't like mess, but we should embrace mess. But when you don't embrace mess, what happens is as de dwelling density goes up, the woody density goes down and it goes down very quickly. It's, a th it's more of a threshold effect um, at about eight or 10 houses per, per linear kilometer on the lakefront, you, get, you pretty much lose vegetation. And of course, Lakeshore development going up reduces fish density, right? So there's a series of correlations. Um, and what's also happening is the wild stock, uh, as the wild stock goes down, we start putting hatchery stock in, and we start stocking our lakes, right? Um, and the probability of walleye stocking increases geometrically, as I said, Midwest data, um, uh, with lakeshore development. Right? So it's not good. The other side of it is it costs money. So taxes go up, this is state revenue going down. Uh, the stocking, so please remember there's a negative and a positive. This is law, money going out, money coming in. You get more money in property tax, but you pay for it in lost revenue and, and stocking. Right? Mm -hmm. um, stocking cost sales tax goes up a bit, but not a lot. So there's, you know, there are pluses and minuses, but ecologically, this is putting no value on the fisheries. This is just looking at the economics of it. And so you've got this death of fish and increase in taxes and uh, increased expenses locally that is going on. Um, and so if you are looking at fisheries, and I kept that relatively short because otherwise I get into this really cool but really complicated social ecological stuff, which is why it's a coupled natural and human systems grant because it's looking more at the people. And what we're, what we're working on is how do you get lake associations? So lake associations are really in the same way that river keepers might be a good target. Lake associations are even better because they manage their lakes and they have pride of ownership and they want fish in them and they want to keep the people out right, who don't live there. And so there's a whole you know, natural capital discussion about you know, locals versus exogenous and how you keep them in and out. Anyway, and what that does for the fisheries, right? So, but I didn't put those slides in. I wanna end uh, with this discussion of Lyme disease and biodiversity because it's truly wonderful. I think it's quite general and it's not well known. Um, so you guys have Lyme disease down oh, here? Yeah, yeah right. You, uh, this year's not as bad as last year. It's not great. It's gonna be bad earlier than later, but, but fundamentally, no one likes ticks and no one likes tick-borne disease. Despite that, the ticks are doing well, Lyme disease is going up, uh, uh, anaplasmosis, sorry, uh, and babesiosis are going up, and then we've got Powassan virus, which is really horrible, and a whole bunch of other things. If you've got Asian longhorn ticks, you've got um, uh, the disease that makes you allergic to mammal meat, uh, that's lots of fun. I've got a good friend who has that. Um, anyway, and you multiply, these, these, the Lyme is a reportable disease to CDC, uh, but we figure one in 10 cases is actually reported. So we're looking at 300 to 400,000 cases of Lyme disease in the United States every year. It's the fastest growing zoonotic disease, um, and it's, it's a real challenge. Um, so 
why is you know why, why is it growing? What well, part of it is land use change? Part of it's climate change. Climate change is allowing ticks to be lots of places they used to die because it got too cold in the winter. So they're now up into the Adirondacks where they never used to be. Uh, you're getting Lyme almost into southern Canada. Never used to have it there, and that's climate change. But also land conversion fragmentation has a big impact. Um, and why does it have it? Well, if you look at the host species and you look at its reservoir competence which is merely a way of saying if a tick bites an animal that's infected, what's the probability it will pick up the disease? And what you see is the species, uh, white-footed mouse chipmunks and a couple of shrew species um, uh, are really good hosts. Interestingly, deer and raccoons and possums are really bad hosts. And we could talk about why this is, but I'm not going to. Um, now, given that these are the best, the small mammals are the best reservoirs um, and hosts, right, which species remain when biodiversity is lost? Right? And so we did another study, uh, the, the looking at competence was one 10-year study, this was a four-year study, and we're looking at community disassembly and nestedness in 12 sites in Connecticut, a uh, bunch of sites um, uh, down in New Jersey and some in, in um, uh, Dutchess County where we live. Right? And basically the story goes like this. In large fragments, you have a very diverse community, and small fragments, you have only those things that carry Lyme disease, mm. right? And that means your density of infected nymphs, right? So we took the nymphs off, we ran them through a blender, we extracted the DNA, and we looked for the disease. The infected nymphs, those tiny little ones, right? Um, as the fragment gets larger, fewer and fewer nymphs are infected, and then that correlates, right, with, with the critters that are there. So why is it that biodiversity has this impact, right? Well, more diverse communities have more hosts that do various things. They hoover up ticks and kill them. So opossums are the poster child for this. Opossums are relatively naked animals. They're really easy for ticks to get on. They're highly social. They groom themselves and each other, and they are tick, tick magnets and tick vacuums. And then they eat them. Right? Um, and so if you do that, you uh, fail to infect those ticks uh, that survive. You have low competence. And so even as uh, tick magnets, even if they didn't kill them, it would be better to have lots of opossums because they would be capturing those ticks and not passing on Lyme disease in a way that a mouse capturing a tick is almost destined to send Lyme disease. So it's this interrelationship between competence and, and just you know, dilution. Right? And, and diluting out the ticks over many more species, many of which are bad at, at passing it on, so the odds of passing it on are lower. Right? What's the generality of this? Well, uh, if your hosts differ in competence right, and pathogens, right, um, and the most competent hosts remain when you lose habitat, uh, then disease transmission should increase, uh, sorry, uh, then disease transmission should increase with biodiversity loss or decrease with in, in, intact communities. Um, Hence what Rick and Felicia uh, Keesing, his uh, co-PI and partner in all ways, they're married, um, put out in a paper called Biodiversity Inhibits Parasites, Broad Evidence for the Dilution Effect. It seems to be fairly general. Now, that being said, there are some people who really don't believe in this. Right? And um, scientists are really good at diluting their impact by arguing with each other. Um, anyway, so what we see is, is if you look at these communities related to ticks, um, mouse density goes up. Ticks go up, you know, and uh, you can see that the residuals of these lines actually um, are, are complicated. But what we see is if you go and look at the predator and tick infection rates, which was the third study, right? this is a 25-year study, and I'll give you a punchline in a second. What you find is um, these guys eat rodents, good, rodents, good. Uh, these guys deflect tick meals from rodents. Uh, by both capturing the ticks and eating them. And then these guys don't eat a lot of uh, coyotes. Again, I love coyotes, but most people don't. And they're, you know, they eat cats, they eat dogs, and they don't eat mice, right? Um, and so what you find is, uh, sh or what you hypothesize is, diverse predator assemblages should be better, right? And what we find is, indeed, if you look at um, infection rates, uh, there's lower risk uh, of, of Lyme disease where you have lots of predators and where you have few predators, there's a higher risk. So there's good scientific data now on this. 
Uh, and unfortunately, or fortunately, because of co-infection rates with other tick-borne diseases, it holds pretty much across the board. Um, bigger effect on anaplasma on the, on the negative side than on Lyme. All right, so high functional diversity really does reduce the probability ticks are infected. So one of the things we can do as planners and as scientists is try and enhance predator recovery. That was another talk I gave at Horn Point to the staff here. We're doing well. Predators are coming back across the board, and so that's a good thing for Lyme disease. All right, before I get into my final summary, uh, what do we do with this? Well, we're st we started a project three years ago called The Tick Project. It should be called The Killing Tick Project. We are working in 24 communities, 100 households per community, killing ticks two different ways. One, we're spraying something called metarrhizal fungus, which is a naturally occurring uh, local fungal infection for ticks. Met52 is a strain that kills ticks specifically. The first thing we did was sprayed it over the 2,000 acres of the Cary Institute. We set up 80 spots, and we sprayed it in 80 spots and looked for collateral damage. And there wasn't any. A little tiny bit on, on some jumping spiders, but that was about it. And it was not statistically significant. We could, we could see it, but we, it wasn't significant. Um, so it's safe, and it's, it's locally occurring. And we're spraying that in six of the communities along with using little bait boxes that have fipronil, which is front line to you guys, and the mice and the chipmunks run through. Those are the ones that have high competency, and they dose themselves with fipronil. We apply it three times a summer. You don't need to put it on every month, right? I, I lean in to make it quieter, but have the opposite effect. Um, so, you know, you, so you can kill ticks two ways. So in six communities, we're doing both. In six communities, we're doing neither. In six communities, we're doing one but not the other, so we're doing, you know, MET-52 but not bait boxes, and in six communities, we're doing bait boxes, not MET-52. So it's a controlled and double-blind, nobody on the ground knows who's getting what, the landowners don't know what's getting what. Rick and Felicia don't know who's getting what. Ben Beard out in CDC, who's a collaborator, uh, knows because someone had to design the study, <laughs> right? But Ben has not told anybody. We are unblinding the study in, in um, we're unblinding, half unblinding, we're opening up one eye, uh, in September. And by, in, by October, November, we hope to have preliminary data to see how well it works. We already, I said to Rick, can you bet which communities got what? And he said, oh, yeah. And he said, I think I know at least which is the placebo and which is the full placebo and the full treatment. Um, if we can do this, it's going to be a really amazing thing because it's going to say, you're not going to get rid of Lyme disease, but it's going to be a way to reduce the incidence of tick-borne disease. I could go into more of this if there's time, but not right now. Let me summarize, and, and then if people want, they can ask questions about it. So, you know, ecosystems to provide really diverse services. I hope I've made that point. Um, there are many ways to assess these, right? Uh, but just because you can measure their value, it doesn't mean the services are important and or ones you want. Think zebra mussels, right? And you need to take a look at services much more broadly than just, is it good for us? Um, and I think that comes about as we start becoming more nuanced in our understanding of how ecosystems work and our understanding of the fact that we don't understand the future anymore and therefore the you know, options values or the legacy value in terms of management of keeping all the pieces is pretty high and getting higher. Uh, so sincere thanks to Dave Strayer, Stuart Finlay, Chris Solomon, and Rick Osfeld for providing all the information. Uh, any errors I've made are mine and all of the brilliance is theirs. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, uh, my email address is on the Cary Institute website, Ginsburg J with an Ginsburg with an E at Cary Institute C A R Y no E uh, dot org. Uh, I would love feedback. Anytime I give a new talk, I really like people to say that worked, that didn't work, this was clear, this was clear as mud. So if you're so minded, do send me an email. Questions? One, two, three. So there are many things you can do to kill ticks. Right? I don't know about milky spore. Um, I do know that the CDC did a major study using uh, permethrin, um, a natural product, right? in a thousand yards. They sprayed it one year. They checked the ticks the next year. Ticks were down 60%. It had absolutely no impact on Lyme disease. And so there are two things or three things to think about. Number one, you're not trying to kill ticks. You're trying to reduce Lyme. 
We know, and the reason we're doing two treatments over five years at the scale of a county in 24 communities is because we know from previous research just killing 60 70 percent of the ticks doesn't reduce Lyme. There's some level of threshold effect, and also people go to other people's houses for barbecues, their kids go and play in the yards, their dogs run around, pick up ticks and bring them back. So even if it works, it's not going to solve your problem because we know that no one treatment does enough. Part of the Tick Project, we're also using um, Salesforce software, and people are registering every two weeks. They get a reminder to tell us how many ticks are on you. Do you have Lyme disease? Does your dog or cat have Lyme disease? You know, how many people visited you? Did they get ticks and so on? So we're collecting a lot of data on, on Lyme and Lyme. We're working with the state and the county Department of Health because we can't look at those data. But because it's a reportable disease, they can, and they're looking across the communities to see if there are differences between placebo and non-placebo. It's a really cool project. It's nine million dollars, right? We've raised seven and a half. If anybody has a million dollars in their back pocket, I'd be really grateful for it. Uh, but so, yeah, I don't know, but I don't think it's relevant. I think in the end, what's the bad thing? So, New York State Parks Governor Cuomo said last, not this year, but last year, in the state of the state, we are going to kill ticks in twelve parks. The answer is, yeah, and you're going to get more Lyme disease because it won't make a difference. People are going to see signs saying, we're killing ticks. They're not going to do their tick checks. They're not going to spray uh, DEET on their trousers. They're not going to soak their sneakers in permethrin. They're not going to do all the things we know actually reduce Lyme. So there is a real problem. If anyone tells you they can reduce Lyme in their garden, say, are you saying you can reduce Lyme or you can reduce ticks? Second question. Um, repeat the question. OK, sorry. Second question. Um, thanks for coming on to speak with us again this year. Um, my question is about, uh, you touched on um, the size of uh, forested landscapes, patches versus bigger contiguous tracts. Right. And I was just wondering, um, I know it's been talked about before for a long time, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts about um, metrics, measures, ways, and what is the right size? You know, obviously, in looking at existing landscapes, um, what you try to measure that. All right, so the question is, what is the right size of a patch or a forest patch in an existing landscape, and, and uh, what are you sort of, as it were, what are you, what are you managing for? Um, yeah, right. Um, there was, in conservation biology through the 80s and 90s, thank God it's gone now, a, a massive amount of argument and discussion about the value of several small versus single large reserves. And I think the same kind of discussions are going on uh, patch size and patch dynamics. I think there are some general rules of thumb. Can, you know, connectivity is good. Bigger is better. Small, there may be a value in having areas where you just sacrifice forests. That it appears from a Lyme disease perspective, more half acre forest plots increases Lyme over just getting rid of them and putting a couple more houses in, right? Now, that may not be aesthetically pleasing, and it may not do good things for water control, and there are other reasons to have trees. I would say that there is, uh, if you, hold on, let me see if I can get, where is the, uh, get back to that um, slide. Um, bum, bum. And there's an easier way to do this, but I'm going to do it the hard way. All right. Um, da, this is the problem of, of animating. It takes twice as long. OK, um, there. Um, if you look at the size of the patch there, about four hectares, right? So what's that, 8.8 .8 acres, 10 acres, right? Is a patch that is going to harbor more diversity, wildlife diversity, and less lime. You know, looking at this, which is not the ultimate data set. But I think there's an intermediate level at which things get better. And then much bigger is better for lots of other reasons, but maybe not for Lyme. But as you can see, the small patches are where you really have problems, right? And if, you know, you're unlikely to get a tick in your garden if it's grass. Right? But if it's at that forest grass interface, that's where you, you know, get a lot of ticks. So that's what I would say, and it's not a thorough answer, but that would be the best I could. Now, there's someone up here who had a hand up, you, and then down in the back. I was wondering about your, your wetland story and you know, how much of the sediment that's in those wetlands derived from the period of, of timber harvest 100 or more years ago. And now we're getting that. that, that getting that, it washed down. Well, it was washed down. It, it created those wetlands. And so now we have this ecosystem oh. that's actually related to past. OK, so, so the question, I think, is how many of those wetlands occur because we put sediment fluxes in? 
Um, so making some simplifying assumptions, right? Let's just assume through the end of the 20th century, the variance in tidal levels was not all that great compared to what it is now, right? It's gotten much worse. My guess is that most of them, just because of the physiography of the, the landscape, existed whether they were smaller, uh, whether they were more fragile, uh, and whether we uh, lost some of them after we stopped that pulse, I don't know. But I will ask Stuart the question and get back to you. It's a real, I mean, the problem with historical ecology is on the Hudson, we might be okay because there may be overflights of the Hudson sufficiently frequently starting in the 30s or 40s, which gets us there. But the problem with a lot of historical ecology is we don't have baselines, right? So we could look at what's happened from 1950 through 2010, right, and see what we've lost. And I know there has been some marginal loss. But it probably got into equilibrium by then, right? So wetlands do this thing where they, they, they decline and rise and decline and rise. But depending on what your average sediment flows are, at some point, as you reduce the amount of sediment, you'll lose a bunch of wetlands. But then the ones that are staying, there's enough sediment coming down on average to keep them there. And so I don't know when that, you know, if there was a, a downside and when it happened. But I will uh, make a note of that, and, and I'll try and get you an answer. In the back? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I wanted to, I was really interested in um, your uh, talk about the, um, like the cost benefit analysis of uh, ecosystem uh, services provided by uh, invasives. Yeah. So what would, uh, could you talk about the, um, the comparison between the benefit of ecosystem services provided by invasives and specifically I'm thinking about the zebra mussel uh, compared right. to the cost of the infrastructure damage that they might do? All right, so I'm not going to put numbers on that. The question is zebra mussels, cost-benefit analysis. They do some good things. They pull out you know, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, they clear up the, the, the water column. That helps SAV, right? Um, so benefits and costs. So if you didn't have power plants, right? That's exactly what I was thinking about. So if you didn't have power plants on the rivers, which in 30 years we won't, right? I'm, I'm pretty optimistic in 30 years we will stop having fossil fuel driven plants. We're gonna have some nukes, right? Uh, so you're still gonna have massive water intake, in fact, more massive for nukes. Indian Point just you know, spends millions of dollars a year getting zebra mussels off their intakes. Um, but if you didn't have power plants, I'd say it would be a really interesting question. Overall, from a biodiversity and ecological perspective, it's a disaster, right? It's, it's whacking all sorts of things with, you know, that clarity comes at a cost. Yeah, SAB and fish do better, but there are a lot of things that rely on those suspended sediments for food, right? And so all those things are being challenged. Um, I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess, but it's the kind of thing that you give me $10 million in 20 years, I can come back with an answer, <laughs> right? So there is the problem. On a lot of these very subtle effects, uh, it requires deep research. Now, you could, I think, look at studies across the world at the way in which increased filter feeders have affected uh, water column clarity and what the impacts are at different levels of, of the ecosystem and, and do a model. But it, yeah, so only, you know, $300,000 in two years, right? Um, I think you could do that. But I, I would say it's, it swings and roundabouts. It's easier with things, you know, where you are doing restoration, right? Um, so I've done a lot of work on tropical forest restoration. And there is an argument for putting invasives in first, right? Because they grab soil, they stabilize things. And if you're managing it, you know, you can, most of them are shade intolerant. And you put them in first, establish, you know, quickly establish a base of support for the rest of the ecosystem. And then you plant over them and they all go away. And if they're already invasive, it doesn't really matter because you're not, I wouldn't bring in a new plant that might potentially become invasive. Uh, I take one of the current invasives. And I think the same thing may hold true. So we know that in the Hudson River, zebra mussels are declining. And they're declining because blue crabs figured out that they could eat them. And so it is a natural adaptation. And this is a very common phenomenon with invasives, where they, they boom. And then of, over time, they, they become part of the ecosystem, but not the dominant part necessarily. And so that will also shift values around as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on the, the direct answer, but I hope that was a good indirect answer. Okay. As you guys all know, when you don't know the real answer, change the question. Um, <laughs> anybody else? Going once up. Earlier on, you were talking about different types of benefits 
uh, from uh, ecosystems. And some are harder to measure than others. Um, my and then you moved on. Uh, my sense is that, and, and I under costs are always easier to measure than than benefits, but when you have a situation where um, there are benefits, you just you the current level of knowledge do doesn't have a good methodology for, for measuring the benefits, um, isn't it still worthwhile to say uh, uh, give a range and then uh, hopefully uh, later on uh, environmental economists will develop more, uh, more and better methods to measure it and narrow down that range. So here we move from science to what I would call management or politics, depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to your community, you're talking management. If you're talking to the governor, you're talking politics. I think the first thing I would do is do a cost-benefit analysis with the things we know and can nail. I would then look at the differentials and ask, OK, how big are the differentials between the costs and the benefits? And then what are the costs we can't measure and what are the benefits we can't measure? Then you put the estimates on those. And, and if you lowball both of them, right, you, uh, you can get an estimate. But I, I think from a perspective of management, what you, as is always the case, I think, in science, what you know, you know, or what, you know, science is a process of knowledge. It's not an endpoint. Um, most of what we know today wasn't true 10 years ago. What we knew 10 years ago was close. But we, we get better, and we get better knowledge. And I think the same thing goes for cost-benefit analysis. The problem with it, from my perspective, is the way it is prescribed in most state and federal legislation is as an absolute rather than as a relative. And so it's like, we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis, and that's what we're going to manage on. The answer is yes, but what are, the, what, what are the, as you said, what are the range of benefits? What are the range of costs that you can't measure? And then equally importantly, I would also add in, what benefits do you really care about? All right, so again, the fisheries question as a lake, if you're a lake that is open access to the rest of the world, um, you may not care about how many fish are in there because why should you be managing for a subsidy for others? And I see my host is standing up, which is always the indication that it's time to go. So uh, that w that's how I would handle that lack of certainty. I wouldn't put it into the, the formal cost-benefit analysis. I would have an iterative process that adds it in later and puts a value, both economic and social, on those things. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.